My name is David Sharon. I've been a faculty member here for about 15 years now at the business school, uh, teaching in the entrepreneurship program and uh, recently more in entrepreneurship and innovation, how those two things come together. I'm going to be going through a presentation this morning about how we do this differently today at the Haas School as opposed to what has been taught to entrepreneurs in the business school program and what used to be the common practice of entrepreneurship uh, in the Silicon Valley in general and how that has been shifting over the last, I would say, about 10 years and now has been formalized into what we call the Lean Launchpad Program or i -Core. It goes by many different names. I'll be going through several fundamental pieces about how that happens here. And I look forward to uh, your participation. Please do uh, provide questions. I know in Facebook Live you can do that. Uh, and uh, we'll pick up those questions as we can. I will ask for questions along the way also. Um, and here we go. The context of this is if you're thinking about starting something today or potentially investing in a startup today, you know, what is different uh, with respect to how we think about entrepreneurship and how innovation has come into that uh, in the way the entrepreneur actually acts? The mindset's still the same. We still have to have a strong bias for action. We have to have a strong personal belief in our ability to change the world. Uh, but the tactics inside the entrepreneurial activity has really become much more formalized. I'll tell you more about that as we go forward. First, I want to set a little context. Um, I know this is a Haas School and Berkeley lifelong learning program, uh, but I want to say from a UC Berkeley standpoint, there have been a lot of changes. Uh, if you haven't been associated with the school for a while, Berkeley has really become a, an entrepreneurial hub. Uh, and it has been remarkable for me to be participating in that ecosystem uh, for 20 some odd years and see it change uh, over that period of time. The school has always been strong in the sciences. It has always developed great students and great PhDs and great technologies. Uh, and we're just getting much, much better and much more fluid at this activity. The Haas School of Business, I, I have to say as my alma mater here, uh, has been developing its practices also. Uh, I want to recognize that we have a new building coming online. Uh, the True Building is a fantastic place and it's going to be a centerpiece uh, for this activity here. I hope that you all can come back either at your uh, alumni reunion or you have another excuse to come back to the school to see the building and see all the wonderful students who are here actively participating uh, in the program. That's really become quite wonderful. The school has also, uh, as you know, uh, taken on innovation as a framework of how we select students, teach students here, and we see the impact in their ability to go out and start great companies, uh, and we're seeing that uh, today. A lot of that takes place inside of inter individual classrooms. This is a picture of the Innovation Lab. Uh, which came online uh, probably five or six years ago now, uh, is our Haas School innovation place. The reason why I wanted to bring this up is that there is now a, a new innovation session section over at the uh, engineering school. The engineering school has become very active in this and teaching how the innovation process works and how students can learn to be uh, thoughtful about what they do, to understand their markets, and to modify those markets over time. And I think we'll continue to see this uh, expansion of how we think of entrepreneurship and innovation. Call it uh, the Berkeley Method if you want, or just call it great fundamental skills in terms of the people who are here and how we train them. We have been focused on two real fundamental questions in the entrepreneurial domain for quite some time. First, what causes failure? Um, if you're an entrepreneur or an investor, you're very concerned about watching for failure signals. What could be causing your uh, new venture, your new idea to fail in the marketplace? We've also been thinking more importantly about what causes success. Um, we know that in the past uh, we've had a lot of failure, uh, but really how do we take an entrepreneur, how do we take a set of people on a team and make them more successful? One way that we're doing that here is we're also adding other resources. Uh, one of those resources is Skydeck. Uh, it is a great incubation center 
for us. And what it has done is it has translated some of the things that we do in the educational as aspects of entrepreneurship and put them into an incubator accelerator program. That program has developed tremendously over the last five years. We've also seen tremendous activities by undergraduates. So I want to mention and call out the house, uh, which was founded here uh, about a year and a half ago. It is a incubator and a fund uh, that was put together by a couple of undergraduates, a group of undergraduates, to help uh, startups, nascent ideas, come out of the Berkeley ecosystem, find its way to the community. These pieces of the puzzle, the ecosystem itself, really is what's driving the success mode. All entrepreneurs need to be connected in their social network. This is a big part of how we become successful over time. Let me drop back out of Berkeley for a minute and talk about the Silicon Valley ecosystem and just give a State of the Union. Obviously, the State of the Union here at Berkeley is very strong. The State of the Union in the Silicon Valley is measured by a couple of different things. First, I want to say we've been defining startups for the entire world for quite some time, 60 years. Uh, we've seen it, actually, the first startup here was in the uh, 1910s, I think, uh, where we had a ship-to-shore radio company. Uh, so we have been actively involved in the startup world for quite some time. We think of startups in this particular format. Um, we think of the venture capital community and our ability to get investments into startups uh, as the primary means of building value in our community. And we have learned a tremendous amount over this time, and we've also spent a tremendous amount of money. We see the spike around the dot-com era, and we also see the increase in the venture capital funding over the last uh, seven years uh, since the financial crisis. This is our frame. Our frame is, how do we get something of value? How do we get capital into that frame and get the entrepreneurs to progress? Um, and capital is an important part of that. What that caused was a bunch of failure. That's neither good nor bad, it's just a recognition of we were wrong a lot. And whether that's a 2 out of 10 make it or an 8 out of 10 don't make it, uh, that was an important characteristic of our ecosystem. I would say that now we're getting much, much better at understanding how we get to success and I'll begin to tell you why. First, let me just say from an ecosystem standpoint, uh, and I'm taking all these slides uh, from CB Insights, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. They've been producing the Money Tree Report for a number of years. <clears throat> it's a great set of references in terms of where uh, the venture capital industry is, and that's reflective of the most important startups here in the Valley. Internet is still the biggest place for deals and for money flow. Over the past few years, though, healthcare has been coming back to life. Healthcare took a lot of um, hits uh, in the late uh, aughts and has been coming back very strong. So we've got $3.7 billion on 190 deals. That's absolutely fantastic. Healthcare is being driven by digital. And this is a big deal for entrepreneurs here. We look to healthcare for many innovations and many activities. We also see a lot still in mobile and telecommunications. Uh, that is an important sector for us here. Uh, and software, which is not internet. So this is uh, non-internet, mobile software, and industrial. Here's the real trend line, though. Over the last eight quarters, we have seen a decline. We are in a business cycle. Uh, the entrepreneurial and venture capital world is a business cycle uh, dependent world. Our business cycle is on a decline. It is not a bubble. It is just simply a business cycle. Uh, what that means from an entrepreneurial standpoint is it's getting a little bit harder to raise funds. Uh, and we're seeing the decline in the number of deals that are getting done. And we can think of that in terms of the raw number of startups. There is still a lot of pressure in this market, though. There's still a lot of great ideas coming out. It's just that there's a little bit more friction between getting that idea set up and going and getting the capital for that idea. This is perhaps the most interesting one. There was this uh, set of companies uh, over the last 10 years that have been formed that we call unicorns. 
Uh, and for me, this is an important uh, chart in that the number of unicorns, which are private companies that have been valued at a billion dollars or above by virtue of their last investment, has started to decline in terms of the birth of those unicorns. There has been an external force that has created this, and that's what we'll, in this uh, CB Insights report, we'll call mega deals. Uh, these are $100 million financings. And this indicates that there has been this pressure from huge amounts of capital to come in and fund companies that are doing extraordinarily well, showing great metrics, and they are at the point of potentially going public, but they can take another private round, another private round, and there's still a tremendous amount of capital available. So the question is now, what has changed? What has changed is the way we view a startup. It used to be the startup was just simply the confluence of people and money. But Steve Blank, who has been in the startup community for a very long time, kind of flipped that definition on, his, on its head. Now we think of a startup as a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. What the heck does that mean? Well, that's what this presentation is going to be about, is how do you find this business model? How do you get a more successful startup uh, in the formation stage itself. So what has happened is we've redefined the entrepreneur's process. The first redefinition is around a process that Steve has coined uh, customer discovery, customer development. And uh, this is a, a slide that represents sort of the customer base of a company that I started when I was uh, just coming out of school here called Scientific Learning. Very interesting company, uh, but it had a huge set of customers. And this epitomizes the entrepreneur's process, is that if I'm an entrepreneur today, I have to know all of these customers. I can't ignore any of them. They have influence. And that influence is something that I need to control. So I can think of this as, uh, you know, my, where's my primary customer here? This is an important part of understanding this ecosystem. Who is my primary customer? That might be the buyer or it might be a user. And then who are all the influencers? And what value do I provide to the influencers to bring them along in this process? There are also a number of companies that have discovered this term called a saboteur. A saboteur is someone in your customer ecosystem that doesn't really want your product, is not going to help you get your product into the market, is not going to help you and your primary user to adopt that product. The question is, okay, if this is what it is from an ecosystem, how do you discover this ecosystem? Steve put this into a book that was published in about 2003. So it's been quite a while, and as you all know, because you've bought books like this, the question is, what's the longevity of the ideas of any of these books? If I looked at the Google chart, uh, the trend line for customer discovery, customer development, this book has had impact when it came out, and it has continued to have impact today. It is one of the most popular entrepreneurial-focused business books that has come out. The key insight that Steve had was around flipping the process from a product development process to a customer needs discovery process. Those of you who are in the uh, design thinking space recognize this uh, quite uh, handily, right? This is what IDEO has been doing for quite some time in terms of discovering customer needs. But it really never had impact uh, in the early stages of the entrepreneurial venture until this book came out. The customer discovery process that Steve puts into this book is how you uncover the needs as an entrepreneur. And it is this process that underlies much of what has changed in our entrepreneurial thinking. We hear this phrase a lot uh, in our world, both at the incubator and accelerator uh, space, uh, that don't build a product that nobody wants. Steve had that experience. He started a number of companies that had huge amounts of funding to develop products. He shipped those products out and discovered after the fact that really they had built a product that nobody wanted. So the focus now is if I have a set of students or if I have a company on the outside that I'm working with, 
we have to understand in depth what those customers need, what they want. And the method that Steve puts forward in this book is called customer discovery. So it's how you search for the model, but it's really how you search for the customer needs. So what we've done is we've taken a search process and we've applied this to the front end of the entrepreneurial process. Very quickly in terms of customer discovery, I have a hypothesis about who my customer is. That hypothesis drives me to go out and talk to those customers. Now at that point, I'm not selling, I'm really listening to them. And if I can discover that these customers have that problem and that they might recognize that problem, then I can go on to the customer validation step. That customer validation step is, hey, will they buy the product? Is there something here that will keep them using the product? Are they, is it the problem, is the problem important enough that they can convince someone else to spend budget to acquire this product? If that's not the case, then what I do is I loop around. I come back to customer discovery, I change my customer focus, and I do this process again. And the key is to get really very efficient at the process. And the other piece, which is usually where failure comes in, is mistaking customer validation for the truth when it's actually bad signal. Meaning, you shouldn't be going to the execution side yet. If you do that, then what your temptation is, is to start to spend a lot of money going out and acquiring customers, spending money on advertising, if that's your primary customer acquisition cost, on sales, and building your company out. That's called uh, premature scaling, and premature scaling is one of the issues that catches a lot of entrepreneurs in the wrong spot. We really want to understand who that customer base is, and we want that customer base to love our initial product. So we start with a hypothesis. This is what we fundamentally teach today. What problem do I want to solve? Now there's a hypothesis in there, which is I think there is a problem to solve. That's me thinking. That's not what my customer says. So it's an assumption on my part that the customer has a problem. That's the first primary difference. Uh, so from an entrepreneurial standpoint, it's not about me thinking that I have this fantastic product that everybody wants. It's me thinking, I think I have a product that everybody wants. Maybe I ought to go out and test that and understand whether the customer really has that or not. The second step is customer identification. So if I think I have this problem that I want to solve, who really has that problem? Who might care about that problem? How are they solving that problem today? Or are they solving that problem today? And why is it important to them? So I get a deep customer understanding, and I do that through the interview process. I go out and talk to lots of potential customers, and I iterate and pivot the idea. So as an example, I'm going to bring up a company called Albus Imaging. Uh, Albus Imaging was a team that I taught in the National Institutes of Health i program. As you go through and you talk to lots of customers, and this team talked to a lot of customers, they were developing a, an understanding, a persona, a, an archetype of who their primary customer is. So this is what they call their early evangelists. They were looking at cardiology and to bring a new imaging modality into cardiologists' offices so that they could better deal with patients who had had chemotherapy and had a high risk for developing cardiovascular disease. And what you see in this diagram is an understanding of what the cardiologist thinks and feels, how they work within their environment, what they hear from their hospital administrators, and what pains or gains they might solve if our product might come to them. And we can put this in what we call the value proposition canvas. Over on the right-hand side is the customer. Over on the left-hand side is the product. This is from a book called Value Proposition Design by Alexander Osterwald. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But in essence, we're putting data into these frameworks to better understand who our customer is. So that's customer development in a nutshell. 
And I want to break right there because that's one of the fundamental frameworks that we now bring into the entrepreneurial activity um, that all entrepreneurs ought to be trained with. So if you have any questions, please do put them into the Facebook um, chat. I'll give you just a couple of seconds to see if, uh, if anything comes up. Okay, I'm going to move on. Once Steve published that book, then we had to break an old habit. And that old habit from a teaching standpoint and from an a investment and entrepreneurial standpoint is I want to write a business plan. So some of you out there, if you took an MBA class, uh, might recognize this particular business plan. We use this as a case in many of our classes. This is Reed Hastings' first company called Pure Software. And we used to have you read this business plan that he wrote for the company. Very successful company as an example business plan. The habit that we used to have, that we have now broken, is the desire to write something down, to take a Word document, put 20 to 30 pages on it, and consider that to be our plan. What I'd like to say is that's a wonderful piece of fiction. All things are beautiful, why would you write anything else? There are rainbows at the customer land. All the charts and graphs go to the upper right. It's nirvana. How many of these things failed? So many that we can't count them. What we had to do is we had to get out of the habit of requiring people to build a business plan, write the fiction, and then believe that fiction. We'll call that a planning fallacy. So that if I wrote it down, and I believe it, then it must be right. And if someone actually funds the business plan, it must be even better. Now, we all know that this is a wonderful document to do, but it changes, right? And our recognition now is why even start there? So we've switched modalities. The modality that we now use is a business model. And our favorite activity here, our favorite framework, is the one by Alexander Osterwalder. So remember, Steve brought out customer development in 2003. Osterwalder brought out the business model canvas starting in about 2004, 2005, and then published a book called The Business Model Generation in about 2010. What this is, it's, think of it as an instantiation of a business plan, but it's not a plan. What it is is a set of representations of how a business might operate. It's a framework that you can fill in. I can fill it in if I'm an artist. I can fill it in if I'm developing a restaurant. I can fill it in if I'm developing the next technology company. It gives me a place to hypothesize without writing who my customers are, where my value propositions are, who do I need to partner with to create a whole product, and whether I might have a profitability model that makes sense, revenue and costs. This framework now has become the lingua franca here at the business school and at many other places around the world. Uh, and it is used by entrepreneurs both inside the corporation and outside in the free market in the venture capital market. It can represent lifestyle businesses. It can represent venture capital-backed businesses. It doesn't matter. It has become a generic framework for entrepreneurs to work with. Now, here's what happens as we couple these two things. We're going to couple the customer development process with the business model canvas. So as we go through and we do our customer discovery, what we're going to do is we're going to look to see if we can build that scalable and repeatable business model. And we're going to start with a hypothesis on what our business might be. So it's a hypothetical business model as we start. We take a guess. And as that guess gets developed by talking to the customers, we start to validate elements of the model. And we do that in a very method methodological form. <clears throat> and we push data into it. Let me just go through this process real quickly from a kind of a four-step model. The, the first step 
is to look for what we call product market fit. Again, a very popular term. It's a little bit hard to quantify. When we start this process with entrepreneurs, we just want a logical fit between who we think our customers are. And these are people. They may be the buyers. They may be the users. They may be the deciders. And the value that they are looking to get from our products or services. Now you'll notice that I said the value that they, th they think they're going to get when they acquire our products or services. It is not what we're going to provide to them, right? It's they don't exist to take our product. We exist to solve their problems. What we have to have in product market fit is a clear set of customers. Definition of who they are. Do you understand them? Can you put an archetype down? And then from a value proposition standpoint, what benefit are they really going to get? And the hardest part here to learn is to not be focused on features and functions of products. That's very important, but really what we want is the benefit that that product is going to bring. So that's step one. Can we get validation around our customers by talking to them? Do we understand the value that we're going to deliver and the benefit that they're going to get? If we get done with step one and we're valid, then we move on to what I'll call step two, which is how do you make money? How could you make money? You don't have to make money right away in a high capital available market. You know, you might push the, um, the revenue lines out quite far into the future. That's okay. But you have to understand where you might be able to monetize in the future. And that comes from looking at the revenue streams, how might someone pay us for this, whether it's a direct payment from the user or whether there's a buyer at an enterprise or whether there's a, another side to the market where we have a two-sided market and one side is paying and the other side is being subsidized. What is that revenue stream? Then the economics start to play in. How do I distribute my product? Do I have to distribute it through a channel? What are the economic considerations that that channel has? Are they going to take a 10% of my revenue? Or are they going to take a 50% discount? And then finally, at the top box in the business model canvas, what is the relationship that I have with the customer? And relationships can come in many different forms. It could be a very transactional relationship where I just sell a product to you. Um, and that's it. It might be consumed. It might be something that you have at home for a while or at the business for a while. But there's no ongoing relationship. Sometimes there's a longer relationship. That might be through support. It might be through upgrades. It might be through a desired continued use of the product, buying consumables. All of that is going to impact the lifetime value of that customer. And lifetime value is how much is that customer worth to me over time? Where we've gotten a lot better in this particular column of the business model canvas is understanding how much money are we willing to spend to acquire a customer compared to their lifetime value or the lifetime value of the system. Great entrepreneurial CEOs know that they can spend a lot of money to acquire a customer if the lifetime value is really high. Typically, we want to see the lifetime value two, three times what we're willing to spend. So we might spend $1,000 to acquire a customer that's going to be worth $3,000 to us over time. That detail is showing up in the way good companies execute against their customer acquisition, develop competitive strategies, and pull the business model canvas forward into how they think about their business. So if we know at least hypothetically how we might be able to make money, and we go out and validate that there's a willing buyer, and we know how to distribute it, and we know approximately what the relationship is, then we can go on to the other side of the canvas. So what we just did was we covered the right-hand side of the canvas. It's kind of the customer-focused side of the canvas. On the internal side of the canvas is, hey, when we start, I like to see in my classroom megalomaniacal students. They start by thinking, I'm going to build this whole thing myself. I'm going to take the entire value chain. I'm going to make my company out of it. But really, step three is, 
you know at some point in time you're not going to be able to build the whole thing yourself. You need to have partners. And those partners may be suppliers, key suppliers for you. You may outsource a whole bunch of manufacturing. Um, you might have supply, uh, marketing partners who are helping you get your product to the marketplace. One of the key considerations here from a startup standpoint is when do those partners come on board with you? Do they come on board at the beginning? Mm, probably not. You need to have a set of metrics that tell that partner that you're doing well before you can actually get the partnerships to come with you. But you need to understand how you're going to develop those partners over time. One of my favorite companies is a company called Ergo. Uh, Ergo is a Haas MBA. Uh, Raphael Michel started a little hearing aid company. It's actually, it doesn't really call it a hearing aid company. Uh, it's a hearing assistance company. It's a very small device that you can put in your ear. And he understands this in detail about how you acquire customers and how that relates to the manufacturing partners that they had to actually create this product. Um, and I think it's a, if you want to learn about how that's going to go, Raphael is a wonderful individual, part of the alumni uh, group here. Um, and the company is uh, currently doing very, very well. So partnerships. Then what we can do is we can say, step four, don't be foolish. You need to have intellectual property to protect your company. You have to have a strategy around that. You need to understand how you hire and acquire human capital. You need to acquire venture capital. You need to do things that get you the assets that you need. You also need to know what are the core competencies, competencies and capabilities of the company. That's the key activities box and how that affects the cost drivers of the company. So as the primary cost driver people, that's the typical Silicon Valley software model. Everything in the company is really a people-oriented activity. Or are you a manufacturing company and the cost driver is going to be the cost of manufacturing, the cost of setting up your tooling and equipment, and so forth. So what we've done is we've just covered the entire business model canvas uh, in a very short period of time. Now there's a lot here. Uh, and as we do this uh, in the customer discovery coupled to the business model activity, we are validating elements of the canvas. And we do that over the entire life cycle of a startup. So let me go back to Albus Imaging, the company that I mentioned before that was looking at uh, cardiovascular disease in patients who had received uh, chemotherapy. They did in seven weeks this number of interviews. They did approximately 150 interviews, and these are difficult interviews to get. They interviewed 58 cardiologists, 53 oncologists, 31 others who were payers and other active members of that community. That's a huge amount of learning. That's a 20 interview a week activity. Now let me make a pitch here for you. I've dealt with a lot of entrepreneurs both inside the classroom and outside. I can't get the entrepreneurs who are outside the classroom to do that intense interview activity. What I can do is if I get them in the classroom and I can make them accountable to getting the customer discovery done, they get a tremendous amount of work done and they learn. And one of the key aspects of entrepreneurship today is their ability to learn. So I'm not going in with a fixed mindset my product, I'll force it on the customer. I'm going, on, going in with a, a mindset that is very flexible, I'm coachable, and I can solve the problem that the customer has today or that the customer will have tomorrow and the customer knows that they're going to have that. So it's a very, very important process to go through in a very quick way because you want to collapse the learning process into a short period of time. And ultimately what we end up with is a population of data that supports what we think the business model is. So remember we started way over here with the business plan a long time ago. Now what I have is a series of metrics that I can describe my business around. I can describe specific customers. I can describe a lot of them. And I'm beginning to develop an understanding of the metrics that matter 
from an investor standpoint, that's what I want to see. I don't really care about your business plan. That's gone. I want to see the activity, the bias for action that the entrepreneur has. And have they been able to direct that bias for action in a way that's valuable to me as an investor? Okay. And what you end up with is a business model canvas. This is the Albus Imaging business model canvas. Here's what I want to do is I want to stop there and just see if there's, um, again, if there are any questions coming in. Just for in terms of time, I'm going to continue on. Um, and we'll take questions more at the end. So now we have this coupling, right? We have customer discover discovery and business model innovation happening at the same time, changing your business model as you move forward. Now what I want to do is I want to talk about innovation. How does innovation actually come back into this process? Uh, and this is a lovely story for me because when I think about entrepreneurship and innovation, innovation tends to be a term that gets used at the corporate level. I think of innovation as a core entrepreneurial process. But there wasn't any really good description of how that happens. Until my colleague here at the business school, Sarah Beckman, published a paper in 2007 called the, uh, Innovation as a Learning Process. Okay? Let me take those two words. Let me take learning first. I just described a learning process. What Sarah and her colleague did in terms of publishing this paper was tying that learning process together with fundamental understanding of what happens in the learning process. And the innovation process is a fundamental piece of how we look at what are the imperatives that come from the customer, how do we set up tests and solutions, how do we observe the customer, and generate insight from the data. Problem finding, problem solving. This is a tremendous frame. It's built out of many activities including the efficient operations within the large company. So whether it's a Kanban operation or other um, ISO 9000 type of operations, it's all kind of doing the same thing, which is how do we tighten down finding a solution for a very specific problem. So we've just discovered a problem, now how do we solve it? Eric Ries put this together uh, in the Lean Startup book. Uh, you've probably seen this, you've probably heard about it. Very simple, build an MVP, go out and test that, measure what the results are, bring that data back, learn from those ideas, and have a change of what your fundamental product idea might be. It's really an efficiency process pushed into entrepreneurship. So that the money as it comes in, the financing as it comes in, I uh, can see exactly the testing that you've done. So you've done the customer interviews, you understand your business model, and now you're bringing the, mark, the product out to the market without spending extraordinary amounts of money to build the product, but matching the solution to the problem. So let me describe one of these uh, typical form in my classroom today. I'm teaching the entrepreneurship class. I have seven projects. Many of them are in software. And uh, software is eating the world. It continues to eat the world, and we're seeing wonderful activities in it. Um, one thing that's really easy to do in a software project is to do a simple mock-up, is to show how a, a software product might change the way somebody perceives an activity, making it more efficient. You can get feedback from that very, very quickly. And that feedback can work an iterative loop in terms of the design of your product, you haven't even written any code yet to tell you what code you should write to solve that product. We see a tremendous number of software companies. And the benefit of this is that the cost of starting a software company has diminished tremendously. I can take those ideas to the market, I can make them happen, and I can do that very cheaply. So from an investor standpoint, I can actually ask for the data that came from all of these phases. Tell me exactly who you talk to. Tell me what your business model is. Tell me how you learn from the testing activities. Software is easy. Let me take a real company now, um, a company called Limebike. Uh, Limebike is a Haas MBA. Uh, started a company that's been funded by Andreessen Horowitz. Um, your ride anytime. So this is a hardware company. They make stuff. And 
the basic idea here is to take the idea of uh, renting a bike, where today if you go into a big city, you go to a rack, you pull the bike off the rack, and you go ride, and then you have to return the bike to a rack. This is actually going with a rackless ride. And there's a lock on it. You have an account that's on your phone. The phone unlocks the lock on the bike that you found. Actually, your phone has directed you to where the bike is. And then you drop the bike off wherever you end your journey. And then someone else picks up the bike and takes it forward. This company has a little bit of a harder time, a little bit of a harder time, with respect to the MVP efficiency side. They need to do a lot of customer testing because one thing that they have to do is change the behavior of customers. They have to understand deeply what that need is but then they have to provide a solution that's extraordinarily efficient. They need to test that behavior in the marketplace. And that testing means that they're going to have to build product. They're going to have to go out and use that product in the market and see what the behaviors are of the individuals who are going to use that product and whether they will adopt the product or not. So we're kind of going from the simplest software to a hardware product. And let me go back to Albus Imaging. Let me describe what this product is. Uh, and the reason why this is so important to do is that these, uh, this wonderful team had an actual imaging product, a multi-million dollar piece of equipment that was going to be bought by the hospital to do cardiac imaging as a diagnostic. What you don't want to do in that situation is to build that million dollar machine, place it in the hospital, and find out that the oncologist never uses it, right? You need to figure all of that out beforehand. You need to put your customer ecosystem together. You need to understand what data they want to see and the value of that data to the payers. And then you can backward integrate into how do we build this product? How do we get the test done? And how do we deliver that through channels to the marketplace so that we can actually solve that product, solve that problem? So that's the lean startup in a nutshell, and now you've got the three fundamental pieces of the puzzle that we bring into the classroom setting. And that classroom setting is anywhere from a one-week intensive to a five-week to a seven-week to a ten-week intensive. We run this at the business school. We run it at the corporate level. And by combining these things together, we get to intensively test ideas and cheaply test those ideas. Not writing a business plan, but adding real data to the real process. So it's a new methodology um, that has spawned all of these programs. Uh, where I teach today is I teach in the Lean Launchpad activity. Uh, I teach at the i program, which is an NSF, National Science Foundation program. And I'll be starting another NIH cohort uh, next week. We also have taught Hundreds of educators, Jerry Engel and I have taught them, we have had other people teach, and now this methodology that you've just heard about has been adopted by hundreds of organizations, both corporate, educational organizations, incubators, and other accelerators, and we've pushed thousands of teams and projects through this activity. One last word. Um, as I came in today, um, my host here, Kevin, mentioned Indiegogo um, and other prototyping activities. The key aspect of an entrepreneur is how they build and maintain their social capital. Entrepreneurs are no longer isolated, right? We used to think of them as uh, people who had strong motivations, but really now we're looking at the social fabric around them as a piece of the puzzle to make them successful. So if I've gone out and I've interviewed hundreds of customers, they are becoming part of my social network. I have them in a customer relationship management system. If I produce a product using Indiegogo or a Kickstarter, I have those customers. If I've done a survey or have had early MVP work, I'm bringing those customers in. I am building my social capital around my company. The faster that you can grow that social capital, Using Facebook as a platform, using any platform that you want, you're going to end up having to maintain that social capital to make 
your company valuable. This explicit goal for entrepreneurs creates the value that you can point to and say, here's my network. Here's my network of customers. Here's my, my network of advisors, of investors, and relationships in the business community that are going to help me get my company forward. And you can contact any of them, and they all validate the activity that I've done. So the social capital piece is an important um, outcome. So I just want to thank you. This has been uh, great for me anyway. I hope it's been great for you too. And uh, I'll take your questions. One of the ways to grow your social capital uh, that is really critical for the early stage entrepreneur um, outside of the customer side is to build a network of people who are your, I'll call them advisors. Uh, it's oftentimes overlooked early in the activity of the entrepreneur. These may be people who have been in your startup world who are good representations of the business model canvas and your activities around it. They are validators. What you want to seek in terms of the advisor is somebody who's going to give you straightforward, direct feedback. So if you're in a classroom setting or if you're in one of these i -Corps programs, the one thing that we really pride ourselves on is the direct and urgent feedback that we give you. So as an entrepreneur building your social capital, it's who's going to give me that urgent, direct feedback. How do I bring them into my methodology? And then how do I bring them potentially into the company as I go forward as either a more formal advisor or otherwise? They will then hopefully tell others about the ideas and the work that you're working on. And if you need an employee, they will give you a, um, an active reference uh, to people in their network. So that's building out your network structure. Follow-up question to that is, how do you apply lean manufacturing? Um, so here's the way I describe this from a lean standpoint in building social capital. As you want one of two things in building your social capital. One is you want to find people who resonate with you. So if you have a vision, a hypothesis of what you're going to do in the marketplace, one way is to sort through the people who have real resonance with that problem. They understand it. They get it. So you want to use that quick screen to understand who is in your network, who's, who considers the problem to be important. If you can find them, that's a great thing. And you'll, you'll go through lunches and coffees and uh, discussions with your classmates, and they will actually tell you when you ask the question, who should I be talking to, who does have this problem? They'll provide you uh, references to other members of your capital of your social capital network. The other piece is to look for people who've, who can give that urgent and direct feedback. So if you find someone who's very difficult, has a specific opinion about your particular problem that you want to solve, are they willing to continue to work with you? And that test is you know, a simple question. Can I follow back up with you as I proceed? Can I talk to you in a few weeks? Can I talk to you in a month? And what you're going to do is you're going to develop a network of people that you can communicate with as a network. So you can put them in your Facebook system, you can develop your email lists, and you can do asks. That's a really efficient way to develop that social capital. Another question that's come in from Lori, sometimes it seems customers don't fully understand what they need. Uh, but they can describe their pain points. So one of the questions that always comes up, and I think this is right in line with this, is um, you know, do we ask the customer what product that they want to solve their, their pain point? What happens if they don't even know their pain point? But clearly from a workflow analysis standpoint, we can see where the pain is. What do we do? One of the challenges in this is if, you can, if the customer can describe the pain that they're trying to solve, can you then take the minimum viable product process, this lean process of 
how do you put a product in front of them and get feedback and understand how you can drive responses from that customer based on the products that you might offer that will reflect on um, that ultimate product delivery. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, one is a company called Excel Biosciences. Um, uh, his name just uh, went out of my head. Uh, and uh, the founder, uh, what he did when he was in the early phases, he just went to Google Photos, Google Images, and he took a picture of the competing product as his MVP. He scratched off the name of that competing product. And when he got to the point of having the customer understood, that customer has this pain, he then showed that picture to them and allowed them to frame their answer around the competing product, or at least what the footprint of that product looked like. He could then quantify the features and functions that would be important for that individual to have in that product. And Brian Feth is his name, uh, has gone out and raised a, a round of capital really through a process of about two years of customer discovery. But the early indications came from this MVP process of how do you test that MVP with them in the interview process. Now I want to be very clear here that there's a mistake to be made too. Never go with an MVP to a customer that you think is a customer, but probably is not. You want to use the MVP process with real validated customers. So I might have had an interview with them already, and they have described their pains, what they might gain if they solve that problem. And once I get to that point of understanding, okay, this is the set of customers that I want to solve a problem for, then you go back and you use the minimum viable project, uh, product process to get real feedback on the actual product development. You're not asking them to develop the product for you, but you're trying to quantify the features and functions that you might provide that would get them the benefit that they need. So I hope that makes sense. Ah, great. Uh, regards from Lima. So wonderful. Uh, good to hear uh, the Peruvians online. Can you use the lean tools? Can you use this for any uh, sustainable social entrepreneurship? The key word there is sustainable. There are two key aspects of social entrepreneurship. Uh, and you know, I, I do teach some social entrepreneurship, but there are many, many people here at the Haas School who do social entrepreneurship in much more uh, detail. I can take the canvas and I can change, change it a little bit to what I'll call is the mission canvas, the mission-based, what, what mission am, am I focused on? And how do I understand whose problem am I solving? Am I really solving the person I'm trying to deliver value to, or am I trying to solve a funder's problem? And social entrepreneurship is really understanding the dynamic between those two and getting to the point of sustainability. Sustainability means that I have a project that is going to last a period of time, that's going to be able to pivot and iterate based upon consumer needs, and that, that activity will have lasting impact in the market that it goes to. Sustainability is a tough word because for social entrepreneurs, how you get to sustainability may be to get supported by a philanthropic organization, or it might actually be charging your customer when it doesn't feel comfortable to charge them money for that product that you're delivering. So I'm on the board of a company called Impact Carbon. Impact Carbon has been uh, selling uh, uh, cook stoves in Uganda for a long time. They've actually surpassed some fantastic milestones after quite a while in that marketplace. They have a sustainable business model. They develop entrepreneurs on the ground so that, that those entrepreneurs actually take those products forward. And now um, Evan Hagler is taking this lean activity and applying it to other activities around water um, in Africa. And I think it's really going to be a wonderful thing to watch how he does that. So great question. OK. I think that's it. Thank you all for listening today. Do stay in touch. 
and um, thank you for your participation.